Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting class on uh, biblical interpretation in Second Temple literature. And in this class, we are continuing with tracing the story of the Watchers as they appear. Starting, it's based on Rashid Vav, Genesis 6, looking at it in the Book of Enoch, in the Book of the Watchers, which is dated possibly to say 250 BCE. And then we're going to trace that and as it develops in the Book of Jubilees, which is 160 BCE, and in other works where they kind of take this story almost for granted as one of an explanation of demons causing sin. And it's actually a very, very popular story uh, in that um, um, it's a very popular story throughout Second Temple literature. And we'll also look at, as the class continues, we'll also look at places where it's kind of rejected as an idea. In other words, yeah, we're going to talk about the watchers, but we're not going to talk about them causing sin. And um, and I would read that as an actual rejection, even though you can say, well, they just they just don't um, they don't know about it. it. It's not it's such a common explanation for sin in this period that it's you wouldn't have a second temple Jew who wouldn't know about this explanation of sin. Now, if you say, well, where does this come up in um, in Jewish in the Jewish tradition? Of course, Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer as a Midrashic collection is known as reflecting some Second Temple traditions. This is one of them. Um, and we also have Uzzah and Azael, the sin of Uzzah and Azael coming up in the, in the Gemara and the Talmud and it being explicitly connected to this story by Rashi. Actually. So we do have it come up much later, but for right now, we're just looking at it in Second Temple literature. So just as a reminder, I'm going to share my screen. We're going to look very quickly at the verses in Bray Sheet because we looked at them last week. And then we're going to re remind what we, because we're right in the middle of Enoch and the, um, of Enoch and, and um, the, where it's developed in the Book of the Watchers. Um, Book of the Watchers being a section of the Book of Enoch. Remember, the Book of Enoch is made up of different parts which are written in different periods. So it's called one book. It's not really one book. It's a collection of works. The Book of Watchers itself seems to be from different pieces and it's way weaving together different traditions about what these angels did exactly that was so bad. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen. And just as a recap, so it's just it's just um, four verses, um, really easy to remember. Um, right when when humans started to kind of multiply on the earth they had women they had daughters these which are some kind of either divine beings in Jewish tradition they're interpreted as judges because there's this thing where you're supposed to bring something to Elohim and it's interpreted as a judge in uh in in Shemot and Exodus but uh, in general, the shot interpretation, the, the plain meaning interpretation is that these are some kind of divine beings. They see the women, they see their good, and they take them, they take whatever women they want. Um, and then we have a kind of a of an of an interjection. Um, God says, these people aren't going to live more than 120 years. Then we come back to our story. Right, and we see that Hanifilim Hayuva Ars Bayimahim. This is when the Nifilim were the land, Begam Acharechan, and also afterwards, Asher Yavo Bnei Elohim El Bnot Adam, because Bnei Elohim had relations with the daughters of men, Viel Dulahem, and they gave birth to them. It does absolutely seem to be that the Nifilim are the children of this union. Hema Hagiborim Asher Meolam Anche Hashem. They are the heroes, men of renown. And it seems to be in its, in if we were to take it out of its context, it seems to be, this is an explanation of, you've heard of those heroes of old. You've heard these stories about, who knows, about Gilgamesh, but great heroes. And they were supposedly, or demigods. They weren't really demigods. There's something divine in them, but they're humans and their lives were, lim were had a limited, they had a limited lifespan. However, in its context, the story comes right before the flood, right before the sinning of the flood. And so it's an absolutely understandable thing to say, hey, this happened, even though in the in the story itself, it doesn't say they sinned, right? 
it happens right before human wickedness goes on earth. So it's not, it's completely understandable for someone reading this or hearing this to interpret that one story led to the next. And in fact, that's what we see in the book of Enoch and the book of the Watchers. I'm not going to um, go back into the whole thing, but the idea what 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 becomes of this story is that we have two main sin. There's a there's an angel Shemichaza who says, "Hey, let's let's have children with these women," and that's their goal. And he gets a whole bunch of angels on his side. There's another angel named Asael who decides to teach knowledge to humans, and he teaches them about military. You could say you could say Warcraft about making weapons. And they teach, uh, and and also he teaches. They, they teach them through the women also, and teach them how to do cosmetics. So one assumes causing the sins of violence and lust. Um, and then they these angels who have married women also teach them sorcery. And it seems like, and here we have them teaching and to reveal to them the cutting of roots and plants, sorcery and charms, cutting of roots and plants. And they this seems to be three different traditions that are being joined here. In other words, this story was already popular enough and you can understand given the verses and they're kind of almost begging to be interpreted. Um, so you have all these different traditions that are kind of being woven into one here. And then they give birth to giants, giants. And then the giants have Nephilim. Now again, Nephilim, we know are giants from Bemidbar, right? In the in, in Sefer Bemidbar, in the book of Numbers, you have the Nephilim being called giants. Um, so that's how we know they're giants, not from the verses in, in, in Genesis and Breshit. And I'm doing this very quickly, um, just to remind you. Um, and um, so you have generations, giants have Nephilim, Nephilim have Eliud, right? And then they start eating everything. They start eating everything, they start sinning, they start devouring, and the earth brings accusation against them. Okay, and then what happens is, this is the other tradition where Asael is teaching, is teaching knowledge to human beings. And what happens are the good angels, the, uh, Michael, Sariel, Raphael, and Gabriel come down to punish them. They get different punishments. Asael gets bound. The angels who had these children are bound and forced to watch their children kill each other, right, under the direction of the good angels. And so they see the death of their children. And then there's the flood to cleanse the world of sin, um, and that seems to be it. Okay, now where does Enoch come in? Enoch comes into the story in this book of Watchers because they then, they, during this uh, punishment, the angels commission him to plead their case. The sinning angels commission Enoch to plead their case. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to flip ahead here. This is more or less where we stopped last time. Okay, um, because remember that the whole thing is Enoch was taken to the heavens during his lifetime. The question is why? So what this book is saying is why? Because the angels needed him to 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 have a case to bring a case for them. Okay, um, I Enoch was standing, blessing the Lord of Majesty, the King of the Ages, and look, the watchers of the great Holy One called me. Enoch described and said to me, Enoch. Right, describe, go and say to the watchers of heaven who forsook the highest heaven. I, I'm going to correct something I said. So in this, they're actually, he's actually being sent to the sinning angels as opposed to the sinning angels coming to him to petition. But you will see that that is actually part of what's going on is that the sinning angels are asking, are going to ask him to petition for them. Okay. So he has to tell them, okay. You will, um, he, has, he has to tell them you will have no peace or forgiveness and concerning their sons in whom they rejoice, the slaughter of their beloved ones they will see, and over the destruction of their sons they will lament and make perpetual, perpetual petition. They will have no mercy or peace. Remember the the angels who have who mated with human women, which is a sin in this in the book of it is very clear. This was a terrible sin. They weren't allowed to do this. They it was an illicit union between angel and human, and they had these horrendous children and their punishment because the whole point in this as opposed to in Breshit, in Genesis, where we saw that it just says that they like the women. It could be they're just attracted to the women, right? We don't know what exactly their purpose was, but we can, you know, just assume from what it says, they see that they're good, whatever that means. Here it says they wanted to have children, 
Okay, so their punishment is they're going to see the death of their children, and then they're going to be bound. Um, and Enoch go and say to Asa El Asa El, who taught forbidden knowledge, you will have no peace. He gets a separate sin, right? You will have no relief or petition because of the unrighteous deeds that you've revealed. You taught them sin. Okay. Now we'll see that the idea is that these angels have somehow brought sin into the world. Okay. Um, so here we have um, the watchers themselves, these fallen angels. And again, they're watchers because Irin, um, which is a common word for angels, probably comes from the meaning of, possibly comes from the meaning of that they're awake all the time. They never sleep. And here in these translations, uh, Enoch is a, 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 a good section of the book of the watchers we have actually in Greek, um, it, it, they're consistently translated as watchers, okay? So whether it's in Greek or in Armenian or in, in, in Ethiopic, this is, this is how they're, um, this is, this is their, um, this is what they're called. Um, um, and they ask that I write a memorandum of petition for them that they might have forgiveness. So like Enoch, who is a, in, in the book of Enoch, especially he is a scribe, again, because he's writing all these books also that we're reading, quote unquote, um, that they're, they're supposed to have been written by Enoch. Um, they, so so he's a scribe and as a part of a, a job of a scribe is actually kind of a law clerk, right? So they're coming to him and saying to him, um, we need you to plead for us, okay? For they were no longer able to speak or to lift their eyes to heaven out of shame for the deeds through which they had sinned and for which they had been condemned. Then I wrote out the memorandum of their petition, and I went off and sat by the waters of Dan, in the land of Dan, which is south of Hermon to the west. So there's, again, there's a lot of wordplay here. Dan, because of judgment, right? And Hermon, because of Cherem, because, uh, first of all, they took an oath. The angels, Shemichaza, made them all swear an oath that they were going to do this sin, right? That they were all going to kind of do this uh, together. And and uh, Hermon, because they are now under Cherem, as it were, they are now um, uh, punished with um, and uh, and 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 made. Um, um, but and and so the, so we're using we're using why this place because of the play on words, okay? And he and he co and he goes up and then he gets an answer, okay? <clears throat> Let me move forward here. Okay. And the answer is forget it, right? Forget it. You're going to see the kid, your, 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 your children will be killed. You are not, you are not going to be forgiven. Um, and we get an explanation of why this sin was so terrible. Let me find it here. But he answered and said to me, and I heard his voice, this is Enoch speaking, fear not Enoch. And the, Enoch is saying, I heard his voice. Fear not Enoch, it's from God. Fear not, Enoch, righteous man and scribe of truth. Come here and hear my voice. Go and say to the watchers of heaven who sent you to petition in their behalf. You should petition on behalf of humans and not humans on behalf of you. Now, there's a general idea. I've mentioned this before. There's a general idea, idea in this period that part of the job of angels is bringing people's prayers to God. And they are supposed to petition on behalf of people. That's actually part of their job. So here you are not, not only are you neglecting your job, but you're asking a human to petition for you. Why have you forsaken the high heaven, the eternal sanctuary and lain with women and defiled yourselves with the daughter of men, taken for yourself wives and done as the sons of earth and begotten for, yourself, for yourselves sons, giants. You are holy ones and spirits living forever with the blood of women you have defiled yourself with the blood of flesh you have begotten with the blood of men you have lusted and you have done as they do flesh and blood who die and perish. There's a very clear dichotomy here. You are all spirit. They are all flesh and blood. You have defiled yourself with them. Again, this I, the idea that we have now, there is absolutely an idea that human beings, of course, have spirit, right? They have life after all. But the idea that we have very clearly in our minds that a human being is soul plus body is not what we're seeing here. And in general is not, completely understood in this period to be like, oh, that's what human beings are, right? In general, there isn't the same understanding that human beings have a soul which can leave the body and is still them, right? That's why you have this idea of what happens, you get res resurrected. What happens to the righteous, they're resurrected because your body is you, 
right? Not that you don't have anything spiritual in you, but it doesn't, the, the, this clear dichotomy that we have um, in our minds is uh, more of a Hellenistic idea, right? And more of a, a, of the idea of spirit and body being completely separate. And that's not what in general we're having here. So you have, you have, you have use angels who are spirit have defiled yourselves with humans. Okay. Therefore I gave them women that they might cast. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I skipped way ahead. So you got had sons of giants and now he's going to explain why this is particularly, particularly egregious besides the defilement. Um, well, continuing with the defilement. So you were holy ones and spirits. We said with the blood of women, you've defiled yourselves, blood of flesh, blood of men, you have lusted. Blood in particular being kind of uh, emblematic of impurity. And also I think uh, um, um, kind of foreshadowing that Noah will be told he can't eat the blood, right? Um, so uh, therefore I gave, so, peep, so people, blood of men, their flesh and blood who die and perish. Therefore, I gave them women that they might cast seed into them and thus beget children by them that nothing fail them on the earth, right? In other words, how can humans live, continue to live? They die. So the answer is through children. Through children and future generations, they will continue on the earth, okay? That's why they can have children. But you originally existed as spirits living forever and not dying for all the generations of eternity. Therefore, I did not make women among you. All angels, as we know, are men, right? <laughs> they're all male, right? Are they, are they, does it really mean anything? Because they not, really aren't really supposed to have bodies, but they're male, right? The spirits of heaven in heaven is their dwelling. But now the giants who were begotten by the spirits and flesh they will call them evil spirits on the earth. Here we're getting to the fuller, you could say consummation of what we call the watcher's myth or the watcher's story throughout this period, where it's not just, okay, they're a bunch of angels. They had they had relations with human women. They, they produced giants. The giants caused all sorts of bad things. And then the giants were killed. No, no, no. These giants are now a mix. They're an illicit mix of spirits and flesh. So they will call them evil spirits on the earth for their dwelling will be on the earth. The spirits that have gone forth from the body of their flesh are evil spirits for from humans, they came into being flesh and from the holy watchers was the origin of their creation spirit, evil spirits. They will be on the earth and evil spirits. They will be called. This is where demons come from. This is where bad spirits come from. They come from these children of these sinning angels with human women, okay? And then the giants are killed, but what's killed are their bodies. You can't get rid of a spirit, it lives forever, right? So their spirits are now tied to the earth and they will cause trouble for among humans for generations. They are the evil spirits. The spirits of heaven in heaven is their dwelling, but the spirits begotten on the earth on the earth is their dwelling. And the spirits of the giants lead astray, do violence, make desolate and attack. Now I have to say that lead astray here is being added by Nicholsburg. You don't have to read it this way. You could simply read it and the spirits of the giants, I'm gonna, I'll tell you why this is important. So hold on just a moment. And the spirits of the giants do violence, make desolate and attack and wrestle and hurl upon the earth. They eat nothing but abstain from food and are thirsty and smite. These spirits will rise up against the sons of men and against the women, for they have come forth from them. Now, why is it important if lead astray is original or not? What's important here about lead astray being original or not is that do they cause sin or not? Because there's another thing that demons cause, which is just horrible stuff to happen, right? So there's, a, there's a, again, when we're talking about the problem of what we call theodicy, which is why do... Let's just put it to like, why do bad things happen to good people? And in this period, that includes also why do good people sin? If God created me, God does not want me to sin, then why do I want to sin? Why do I ever have the urge to sin? And that's also a problem during this period. Here, it could simply be answering the first problem, namely, why do bad things happen? And the answer is because there are these demons and they can cause all sorts of bad things and they hurt people, right? Or you could also say, well, they hurt people and they also cause sin. Now in Jubilees, that we're going to read later, 
There's no doubt these guys cause sin. Here, it's not 100% clear do they cause sin or not. Okay. Um, from the day of the slaughter and destruction and death of the giants, from the soul of whose flesh the spirits are proceeding, they are making desolate without incurring judgment. Thus, they will make desolate until the day of the consummation of the great judgment. When the great age will be consummated, it will be consummated all at once. In other words, these demons are going to be able to wreak havoc until the final day of judgment. When we have that idea, the final day of judgment ends all evil, it will end these evil demons, right? And then also we have, of course, relating to Asael and those who revealed mysteries, right? And now say to the watchers who sent you to petition their behalf, who formerly were in heaven, you were in heaven and no mystery was revealed to you, but a stolen mystery you learned. And this you made known to the women in your hardness of heart. And through this mystery, the women and men are multiplying evils on the earth. Say to them, you will have no peace. Okay, because they married these women and they gave them knowledge. Now note that, the women are not really being blamed here. I, I, I'm not saying that this is a some you know a huge. You know, the women are really not being blamed anywhere in this story. They're not being held responsible. Um, it's really the angels who are sinning. Even when you're talking about the mysteries that's making them known, it's very quickly that the women and the men are then spreading this. So it, it doesn't. This isn't one of those stories where let's blame sin on women. It's much more. Let's blame, blame sin on these demons that came out of these angels who had this illicit union. Um, now, if we move ahead. Um, okay, and here we see in chapter 19, um, the, the punishment of the watchers. And Uriel said to me, Uriel is the angel who's leading, leaning Enoch through uh, some of the chambers of heaven. There stand the angels who mingled with the women and their spirits, having assumed many forms, bring destruction on men and lead them astray to sacrifice to demons as to gods until the day of the great judgment in which they will be judged with finality. And the wives of the transgressing, transgressing angels will become sirens. So here the women are, those specific women are blamed as, and, and they're going to, they're going to get some kind of punishment. But which isn't, it's not super clear what it means here by sirens. But one thing that's important here is, again, their spirits. Here it sounds like it's the spirits of the angels themselves, not their children. Okay. They bring, um, they bring destruction on men and lead them astray to sacrifice to demons as to gods. Now, this is actually interesting and not necessarily talking about general sin. It could be saying they have these forces when human beings see these forces happening in response to whatever they do, and it's not God, they will start worshiping demons, right? Because that's what's, that's what's actually causing things. They, they cause people to worship demons because these evil spirits do things, okay? Which is another possible way of reading it. Now we're going to see, again, in the book of Jubilees, we're going to see a fuller um, 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 development of this where it's absolutely talking about these um, these. Uh, causing uh sin uh any sorry yes sure yeah. go ahead I just, so, um so these results of these relationships these then they're, they're giants and they're demons or they're like okay. meaning so what it mm -hmm. seems to be is the giants are killed so originally they're giants right so yeah. in the in the generation before the flood um, you've got giants right now how right. do they see it in terms of um, the book of numbers, like, cause it talks about the, oh, they're still giants. So did some of them supposedly survive, but the way it's told here is they all get killed and then their spirits become demons. Now there oh, yeah, does seem to be another version where it's possibly the spirits of the sinning angels themselves that become demons. But the main thing seems to be the offspring of this union, their physical forms are killed because they're giants, they're killed. And then their spirits become these demonic forces. Okay. okay. Um, and I'm sorry, this is like sure. a beginner question, maybe. Who do we think actually, who do you think actually wrote this, this, this whole Watcher story? So we, we don't know. Um, and that's kind of the point of having it in Enoch's name is that you're not supposed to know because that way you'll believe in it more. You'll give it more credence. You'll, you'll think it's much more important if you could say, well, it's from Enoch. So, and there's really no way for us to know who could have written it how many people could have, who edited it. Um, and again, this is, you can see from the way it's combining different things that it's weaving together things that are even earlier, 
right? So, so it's 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 using it's drawing from stories that are ha- that are already being told or even already mm-hmm. being written, perhaps, and 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 weaving them together. So it's it's very hard to know, and even when we date it, it it can be it can be difficult. And but does it draw all, from biblical stories? I guess it's well, based it's on because the whole thing is drawn right, from right. from Rashid Vav. Mm-hmm. It, it draws. It absolutely goes back to the biblical story. We even see Jubilees. Jubilees goes first back to the biblical story, and then it starts drawing from Enoch. Right. So so it goes. So they they never stop read reading Torah. Right. It, mm-hmm. And this is important to note because some of these books, um, some of these books are written as if they're supposed to replace the 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 Torah specifically like the Pentateuch the Hamisha Chumashe Torah um and yet it's very clear that everyone's still reading the Torah no one is no one is reading this instead of and some things that are written in ways that you have to that they're assuming people know the Torah and the those books and what it's written there you know and they can and they can compare. Um, I see in the chat um, there's a question from Danny and Libby. Didn't the first human sins predate the watchers mating with the humans to produce the Nephilim? Yes, certainly. The human sins, they say Adam and Eve and Cain, absolutely. Um, the point, I, I maybe misspoke when I said, it's not, or I don't think I said all sin. I guess you can say, well, it's not the our, it's not supposed to be the origin of all sin, but it's the origin of kind of forces for sin. Right. And again, it's much more rather than saying, why did Adam sin or why did Cain sin? It's much more of why do I want to sin? And we're going to see that later on in the class when we look at some prayers from the Dead Sea Scrolls where they're actually referencing these spirits. Like they're saying the bastards are in spirits are inside me and they are fighting with the laws of God. Right. So that's what it's good for is to explain why in the world do I a righteous person want to sin. And you can say there are different explanations. It's not, this is not the only explanation, by the way, at all, right? At all. But it's one very prominent explanation for 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 these urges for the for for sinning um among humans. Now I, I will point since you brought up, uh, it's very interesting that Cain and Cain and the verses that are spoken to him that are kind of an oracle about sin, and I've mentioned this before, where it's actually a statement about sin that is said to Cain, and you would think that it would spawn a whole bunch of literature, and it doesn't. And the question is why? And the answer that I, the only, the answer that I could come up with, because you do see certain references in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but it's always in the reference, um, it's kind of in the context of like sinning evil angels or people. Um, you know, sinning, sinning evil like demons. Um, and I think it's because Cain Cain is, is so clearly a sinner that I don't care how sin works for him, right? It doesn't matter to me. I am not an evil murdering sinner. I care about how sin works for me. So how does sin work for me? I have to look somewhere else, not at the first murder. Um, but, I think that is, that is how I can understand it, yes. But I, I mean, even if you say that about Kai, you know, you can't say that about Adam and Eve. I mean, yeah, but 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 what I'm saying is that this is not that's true. Um, I don't think that this is trying to explain where all sin and all history came from. Like, and again, it it coexists with other explanations of sin, right? It's, it's um, just, it, it seems to me that the Adam and Eve story is meant meant to be the paradigm of human sin. Okay, so no. And so, so, no. Don't so, so I would it. say no. I would argue Why aren't they no. satisfied with that? <laughs> I would argue no. I would argue it's not supposed to be the paradigm of human sin. I would argue the Adam and Eve story is meant to explain what it actually explains, which is it explains why humans have to work for their food unlike animals, why they wear clothing unlike animals, why women give birth with struggle unlike animals, why are humans so different from animals and why does it suck, okay? And the answer is because Adam sinned, right? Adam and Eve sinned and that sin actually distanced them even further from animals. Um, and I, I've done this exploration with some of you before. I'm happy to dive into it another time. Um, it, it doesn't really have to do with second temple interpretation. 
Um, it, it actually does have to do with Second Temple ter interpretation in that the origin of sin coming from Adam and Eve is something that we first see in surviving Jewish literature right after the destruction. In other words, in the book of Fourth Ezra, it's very prompt. Fourth Ezra and Second Baruch, both, both written shortly after the destruction of the Second Temple, um, are both have this idea and are and are dealing with this very prominent idea that sin came from Adam. Okay. Um, did it come from Adam's sin? Did it come from Adam itself? It gives they give different different explanations. I, I've quoted Second Baruch um more than once because it has this great line, which is don't um blame your sin on Adam. Everyone is his own Adam. Right. Um and and I I just I love that as a as kind of a of a thing like, hey, okay, Adam sin, and you're sinning. You're you're your own Adam, buddy. Um, but we see how prominent it is right after the destruction. It almost certainly exists. Well, we know it existed because Paul lives before the destruction and he absolutely uses that as an explanation of sin. So we know that people were talking about it, but in our surviving literature, it's barely there. Like I've said before, there's a hint to it in Ben Sira. We'll talk about that when we get to Ben Sira. Um, there's a hint to it in Ben Sira, but in general, that's not a, uh, an explanation for sin. And if you just read the plain meaning of the story, it's not explaining where sin comes from. Is it a sin? It happens to be a sin because it's disobedience of God. Is it the paradigmatic sin of any Cain sin? Cain's sin is much closer to a paradigmatic sin. It is the ultimate betrayal, and it, it really is presented. The ultimate betrayal, which comes out of emotion that you can understand. I mean, if you want to talk about a paradigmatic sin, having someone being treated ostensibly unfairly being really, really angry and taking it out on with violence, that's a pretty paradigmatic sin with no explanation of why he was treated so unfairly. We never get that explanation. Why in the world didn't God accept, accept his sacrifice? We don't have an explanation in what's written. All we have is like, he's upset. And then God's like, hey, don't be so upset, right? You, you have control over this. And he apparently decides he doesn't have control over it. Now that's super paradigmatic. It's, it's presented as paradigmatic in a way because you have you have a statement from God to Cain telling him this is how sin works. This is how sin works. Sin wants you, but you can resist. You have control, right? And, and we can have this whole discussion of it, but what's funny is that it doesn't resonate much, does not resonate much with Jews during this period, which is very interesting. Of I'm course, happy. yes. The, the the concept of original sin becomes a central tenet of Christianity. Uh, much yes, more so and, than and it becomes and and oh, uh, as, it, uh, original sin as 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 an Adam and Eve. Right, right, and but part of that is also this idea that you need the the, the idea that if everyone if everyone's born in a state of sin, then the idea is that Jesus takes them out of that state of sin, right? Whereas the the um whereas here like enoch is not talking about a state of sin right um we, there are in the dead sea scrolls you are you, you do have references to things that you could call a state of sin you could call like that the human condition is kind of a state of impurity and and kind of sin that you need to be lifted up out of but more of impurity um, and, and so, but let's, we'll talk about that later. We'll probably, when we talk about the Hodayot, because the Hodayot really has this idea of being in a state, you could say a sinful state that you need to be raised out of. Um, and that's in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So mm -hmm. let's move on. Yes. The, the, about the, the question of whether all sin is being blamed on them. There is, a, there's at least one place that, that we looked at, I think in, in chapter 10, where God uh, tells Raphael to cast uh, Azael into the pit, mm -hmm. um, where it actually says there to him, ascribe all sin. Um. Yes. So I don't know. Like I don't think I don't think it's meant to be particularly literal because it's especially here because it's being interwoven with all these other sources of sin, right? But but it is the idea that this that sin comes from. From, from forbidden knowledge. So it is absolutely kind of a parallel explanation of where does sin come from, from this knowledge of things that we really shouldn't have. Um, and again, what Asael reveals is not witchcraft. What Asael reveals are pretty much crafts, but they just have to do with 
with with weapons and and jewelry and cosmetics, right? And so, and these these uh, and this idea that this knowledge kind of leads to sin um, is almost it, it, the question. So, what do you? So, it it doesn't it doesn't really take um, responsibility away from human beings the way you could take it away with these with demonic influences. Um, um, but it is absolutely it makes sense as an explanation, right? How, why? How did we get? It's a nice. It's a. It, it works as a story. Why? Why did humans even think of making war, right? Why did humans even think of putting? Why would a woman need to put on makeup, right? So an angel. It's an angel. An angel. An angel did it. An angel taught us, and now. This is what we're. This is what we do, and it causes all sorts of problems. Um, of course, it is a. It's a, also absolutely a statement saying that weapons, by definition, are evil, right? And, and, you know, and weapons by definition are going to cause, allow violence, and cause violence. So you could have a whole like lecture just based on that. Um, um, I I don't know. Um, I don't know how literal you could possibly take that because he he teaches specific things, and obviously there are other ways of sinning. So, I mean, you you could say like violence and and lust are <laughs> cover a lot. They, they they do cover a lot. So you could say he does a, he did a pretty good job, you know, of covering like some of the basics. Um, anyway, so so moving along, so I, I I I do want to say anyone who wasn't here at the very beginning, um, I do have almost a hard stop nine i can go like a few minutes over but i i don't have i don't have that much longer but we do have time to kind of go into um jubilees so we're, we're going now to look at the book of jubilees now jubilees is quite a bit later than book of the watchers um now we do have in some of the later sections of enoch there are references also to the story of the watchers and i we, we looked at that a little bit when we were kind of going over the book of enoch but um it, you see a real development in Jubilees. So Jubilees is dated to 160 BCE, and that's because there is a, a kind of um, a prophecy in it that is considered to be referring to uh, the Maccabees. Excuse me. So it's generally dated to one to around 160 BCE, and um, and it takes these and it and it, it's it, and it presents itself. Jubilees presents itself, and we're going to take a, we're going to deep dive deeper into Jubilees later in the class as a work because there's a lot to say about it. Jubilees presents itself as the secret book that was given to Moses to Moshe about what really happened, what really happened from the creation of the world to now to Sinai. So it covers Reshit and part of Shemot, uh, Genesis and part of Exodus, essentially the story part, right, the good part. Um, from creation on. And it's meant to be the real story. However, you cannot read it. You can't really read it on its own. I, and I I always give the example of where it references the Chatan Damim story, the bloody bridegroom story, where Moshe is very mysteriously on his way to Egypt. He's very mysteriously seems to be attacked by God himself. That God Himself wants to kill him, and Sipora saves him by circumcising their son and throwing the foreskin on, you know, down and saying, "You are a bloody bridegroom to me." Like so, and and it's a very weird, a very weird story. And what Jubilees does with it is, um, the angels say to Moshe, they say, "Do you remember when the angel Mastema, who's kind of the Satan character in Jubilees?" I said, do you remember when the angel must not tried to kill you on the way? Now, this makes this is a reference, this is a callback that makes no sense unless you know the story, the full story that was told in 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 um in Shemot in Exodus. And if you know that, you say, Oh, it's fixing it. It's saying it wasn't God who wanted to kill him, it was this angel Mastema who wanted to kill him. But you don't understand that unless you know the original. So let's let's dive into Jubilees and see what Jubilees does with this story. Again, we're going to come back to Jubilees later after. I just want to, uh, this series is just kind of tracing the Watcher story as we find it developed through these works. Okay, so we're in the book of Jubilees. This is a translation um, by Jim Vanderkam. It is an excellent translation of the Ethiopic. 
Um, you can, he's, he's very, he, it's, it's really a one-to-one -one translation, um, highly recommended. It's easy to, to find actually. Uh, and, um, and you can see here, we'll see that it actually sticks very closely in chapter five to the account in Genesis and Breshit. When mankind began to multiply on the surface of the, of the surface of the entire earth and daughters were born to them, the angels of the Lord in a certain year of this Jubilee saw that they were beautiful to look at. So the reason the book of Jubilees is called Jubilees is because it dates everything in weeks of years and in Jubilees. So that's how it kind of, uh, you can count out the years in the book of Jubilees. Um, as Vanderkam has noted, has noted um, the, uh, the Jubilee of Jubilees, the 50th set of 50 years in the book of Jubilees includes both the exodus and the coming to the land, namely the jubilee freeing of the slaves and the jubilee returning of the land, a land to the original owners. Um, so that's kind of a nice note that it manages to do that. Um, and But here we go. So when mankind began to multiply on the surface of the entire earth and daughters were born to them, the angels of the Lord, daughters, um, uh, the angels of the Lord in a certain year of this jubilee saw that they were beautiful to look at. So it's a translation of good to beautiful. They saw they were good. They saw they were beautiful, but it's an understandable translation. Um, translation. So they married of them whomever they chose. They gave birth to children for them and they were giants. And here we're going to see a little bit of a change. Wickedness increased on the earth all animate beings corrupted their way, every one of them from people to cattle, animals, birds, and everything that moves about on the ground. All of them corrupted their way and their prescribed course. They began to devour one another and wickedness increased on the earth. Every thought of all mankind's knowledge was evil like this all the time. Okay, so what happens in this case, they have children and their this sin creates wickedness on the earth. It's very clear that their corruption, the angel's corruption of their way, is kind of catching like a disease. All animate beings corrupted their way. All of them corrupted their way in their first five course. They began to devour one another. And this is kind of a callback in Enoch. The giants start devouring everything. Here, everyone is devouring each other and wickedness increased on the earth. Every thought of all mankind's knowledge was evil like this all the time. This is a callback to Breshit, to Genesis, right? That God saw that humans' thoughts were wicked all day, okay? Uh, the Lord saw that the earth was corrupt, that all animate beings had corrupted their prescribed course, that all of them, everyone that was on the earth had acted wickedly before his eyes. He said that he would obliterate people and all animate beings that were on the surface of the earth, which he had created. He was pleased with Noah alone. So God sees that this is what's happened on earth. He's going to bring a flood against his angels whom he had sent to the earth. He was angry enough to uproot them from all their positions of authority. He told us, us being the angels of the presence who are giving Moshe this book, right? Um, so it's this, this whole book, the book of Jubilees is all narrated by these angels of the presence, right? Uh, Malach Panim is the angel of the presence. So that's who's narrating this book. So um, he told us, the good angels, to tie them up in the depths of the earth. Now they are tied within them and are alone. Regarding their children, there went out from his presence in order to strike them with a sword and to remove them from beneath the sky. He said, my spirit will not remain on people forever for they are flesh. Their lifespan is to be 120 years. This is actually using, doing more biblical interpretation than Enoch did. It says, oh, we've got to go back and explain that verse that said, okay, my spirit will not remain on people. Um, their lifespan is going to be 120 years. It seems, the explanation seems to be here. I'm, he's referring both to the giants and perhaps to the, and to the flood that's coming now. He sent his sword among them so that they would kill one another because the giants are violent. They began to kill each other until all of them fell by the sword and were obliterated from the earth. Now their fathers, the angels, were watching. But afterwards, they were tied up in the depths of the earth until the great day of judgment, when there will be condemnation on all who have corrupted their ways and their actions before the Lord. He obliterated all from their places. There remained no one of them whom he did not judge for all their wickedness. He made a new and righteous nature for all his creatures so that they would not sin with their whole nature until eternity. Everyone will be righteous, each according to his kind for all time. Now, this jump to kind of everyone's going to be righteous, which clearly doesn't happen especially since we're still kind of 
before the flood, um, is also also seems to be drawing from in Enoch, if you remember, before the flood, it talks about how all evil is going is going to be destroyed, was destroyed, and all righteousness. So this also seems to be using that same structure. Um, the the who, um, the author of Jubilees here has an eye on Enoch at different times. Um, so um, moving uh, forward, I'm going to go to the other places where um, these watchers are referenced, and the story is referenced. And moving ahead to chapter seven. Can I ask a question yes. while you're doing that? Yes, yes, please do. Um, so who when when the discussion about we just read about they'll all be good after that. Is that referring to human beings or to angels? Because no, no, it's referring it has to refer to human beings because <laughs> angels are the 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 evil angels are going to be destroyed at the end time, right? There's no cleansing that needs to happen among angels. There were bad angels and there were good angels, and the bad angels don't get forgiven and they don't get cleansed. Okay. Human beings are the ones who uh who can get who can get um who can get cleansed. Um, so I see a, a, your, um, a question, your question also, what the original language of Jubilees is. Thank you. Jubilees was written, in, um, Jubilees was um, supposedly written in Hebrew. We do have fragments in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, it was written in Hebrew, translated into Greek, and then translated from that into Ethiopic. So we have the whole book in Ethiopic. And this is a translation of the Ethiopic, what we're reading here. And who, who wrote it? Do we know? No, in general, the Second Temple works except for Ben Sira, because we, we have his name and we have, and his grandson even referred to him when he translated his book. But in general, it's rare for us to know who wrote any particular work in this in this period. Uh, and, in general, and even, yes, and even Dead Sea Scrolls, it's in Hebrew, not in Aramaic. Right, correct. Um, and when you say like end time, day of judgment, can you just explain that a little bit? Oh, sure. So um, we already have, uh, particularly in the in the biblical prophets and the Nevi'im, that this idea of a Yom Hashem, the day of the Lord, a day of judgment, uh, usually in those in uh, in those works it involves a a huge battle with nations. Um, you have other things where there isn't a, a very violent day of judgment, just kind of a messianic age where everything is peaceful and wonderful and everyone recognizes God. Um, in, in these works, um, what you would call apocalyptic works, they are generally all talking about this final day of judgment. Again, the idea that, uh, frequently the idea is that the righteous will finally be rewarded and the evil will finally be completely punished and evil as a thing will be destroyed um, at the end time in this final judgment. So there's a holding period until then when perhaps the wicked suffer in the meantime, uh, they may they may be in holding pits where they're, you know, where they uh, experience, let's say, burning or something similar. But the main punishment is going to be at this end time, right? And the main reward for the righteous is also going to be at this end time. Um, you don't have, in general, there are, at this point, there are, and you can see it in Enoch, you see there is absolutely a description of kind of the heavenly chambers and what happens, et cetera, in them, but there isn't the same sort of idea of hell and heaven, which you have later on, where it's, um, where you, where like, okay, there's a special, there's a specific hell, and this is what happens to this sinner, the human sinner, this is what happens to that human sinner. In general, everything's kind of waiting for this end time when all, everything's going to be you know, and again, not that the wicked don't possibly suffer in the meantime, but that's not the emphasis. Miriam, so do yes. Sorry, just one. So, so let's let's end with questions because I see there are a lot of questions because me and we have eight minutes left because I really do have to end um, um, more or less on time tonight. Um, and we're going to continue with jubilees in our next class, and we're also going to be able to to kind of really dive deep into what jubilees does with this story. So yes, you were you were um, you were saying. I was just saying, I, sorry, I just wanted to say, so So today in the Jewish tradition, we still have the concept of end times or like day of judgment and we mean it to be Mashiach. Is that what it is? Uh, we, we absolutely have the, so first of all, it's um, the Yom Hashem, the day of the Lord is so embedded in so many of our prophets that we absolutely have this idea, right? Of this final Gogu Magog, right? The, the final battle. Um, these are things that are, uh, kind of the 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 judgment day where God is in judgment of all the nations. Um, in certain uh, cases, and especially later on, you like 
that you have maybe Mashiach is also kind of filling a role there. Um, but um, this, we absolutely still have this idea because how can we not, because it's so clear in our different books of prophecy, not again, not all of them, but it's so such a clear concept. And we have that concept from very early on, the, what we call the day of the Lord. Um, and is uh, like you have Amos saying, why do you want this day? It's going to be darkness and not light. And his point is there's kind of this, and again, this idea that that judgment day is the precursor to this wonderful messianic age, right? This wonderful age where everything is, is rainbows and, and puppies. Um, and you, and the, however, the day of judgment in for certain prophets is a real day of horrible violence that you have no reason to think you're necessarily going to be okay. Like you personally will not necessarily be okay because it's, it's a really difficult time. And then you can see that even in later prophets like Zechariah, where there's this, uh, Zechariah, where, where there's a description of um, this tremendous, horrible uh, war that is going to befall Jerusalem. And it's not, it's horrible. Like it's people die, women are raped. It's just a horrendous thing. And this idea that um, that is the precursor, you know, to the, to the kind of the end time. Um, and it's, it's a different, and, and so you have that idea kind of going, continuing through it, at a certain point, and particularly when uh, the books that we're looking at, if you're righteous, you're going to be fine on the day of judgment. That's not true with biblical prophecy, but at this point, everyone's like, okay, if you're righteous, it's going to be absolutely, you're, you're going to be cool. It's no problem. Um, and that's not necessarily the way that earlier prophets looked at this, looked at this kind of final apocalyptic battle. So Miriam, uh, yes. Um, now that we're moving from uh, from Enoch to Jubilees, and I, I re we we discussed this at length in the past, um, and I, I I just remember that the bottom line is we don't know. But um, I remember reading at some point, and I wish I remember who it was uh, who said that even though there's a big difference in time between um, Enoch and Jubilees, that what they have in common is that they represent um, uh, the, the the literature of the literate uh, Jewish aristocracy that thought of themselves as representing mainstream Judaism, but sometime in history, presumably in the first century, the literature becomes associated with the Sadducees. And because of that, um, when the Pharisees basically take over and dominate Judaism, um, this, 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 uh, this literature is shunned um, and obviously not canonized. Um, and in subtle and unsubtle ways, Chazal sort of fight against it. Well, well, I think a big part of what ties Enoch and Jubilees together is if you're keeping a lunisolar calendar, it's very hard to keep these books as we have them. Like, can you keep parts of them? Sure. Um, but, ju well, Jubilees, no. Jubilees is very much, and I, I, I'll show you uh, next time, it, it's very, very clear. There's a 364-day year. That's what you should be keeping. Enoch, of course, has a whole section on how you should be keeping a, a solar year. Um, so anyone who's not keeping, who's keeping a lunar solar year, and of course the year is very, very important to Jewish observance, um, they're not going to particularly want this book. Uh, so to the extent that um, Sadducees or Stokin were keeping a, were wanted to keep a solar year, this book would have been okay with them. Um, would I say that it's necessarily one-to-one? -one? Uh, I, I, I think that again, because in the in the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea Scrolls, especially look at Jubilees, um, certainly um, they consider Jubilees very important. And the extent to which Enoch is important, they they have it. They have copies, right? So it's not clear how central it is, but they have copies, and it works for them because again, they are also for a solar year, and they also keep Sto Stoki or Sadasi Halacha what we know of the, like they have an absolute overlap between those, you know, that they're keeping those laws. And of course, there's a tradition that still came, did in fact believe in a, perhaps in a solar calendar or, or Beethoven, you know, the, 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 there's, 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 there's these different, um, that that is one of the things that's being, that's embattled. Um, at the same time, it's not just the Pharisees. So you don't have it again, if we say the Septuagint is based on the Alexandrian Jewish library, they don't have these books. Okay. To them, these books are not, they, it, it doesn't reach them. 
say, well, why does, well, maybe they don't read Hebrew. They, don't, they, they, they kept, they, they, they translated things in Aramaic. They translated things from Hebrew, but they didn't, they didn't have those, these two books. They are not in the Septuagint. They're not in the Alexandrian canon. Okay. Now they do make it into the Ethiopian church, right? Um, and that's how we have these books in their entirety. They do, they are copied at Qumran. They are, you know, so there is, there is absolutely a readership, but it's not just a Sadducee Pharisee thing, right? It's not, the Pharisees aren't the only ones who are like, you know what? This is a little weird, right? And again, it's not surprising because if you look at the, in general, if you look at um, at the Apocrypha, those books that were kept by the Alexandrian Jews as part of the Septuagint, um, those books in general don't go against standard Jewish practice, right? You, you, they, those books are not meant to cause tremendous um, um, legal issues for you, even though they don't necessarily always match exactly. They're not, they don't direct generally, they don't directly contradict anything that would have been standard Jewish practice. Um, so you could understand, again, the Alexandrian Jews as well, if one is assumes, assuming that they're going to the temple or at least have this, um, have an aspiration to go to the temple three times a year, they've got to accept that calendar, the calendar being kept at the temple, is the calendar, right? So they're not going to start saying it should be a solar year. Uh, so, but but at any rate, these books, to, just, to call it just a Pharisee Sadducee thing is oversimplifying this period of Jewish history. I, I, believe, I believe the, the Hasmoneans were associated with a lunar calendar. So these books would be foreign to them as well, wouldn't they? Lunar solar calendar. We're talking about, no, no. Oh, you mean would it, be, it would be foreign to them? The Hasmonean dynasty, did they, didn't they uh, adhere to- I, I mean, as people? far as we know, they're lunisolar. Again, and I've said this before, in general, the ancient, the Near East kept a lunisolar calendar. It wasn't until you had the Greeks comparing calendars that some were saying, hey, a solar calendar would be better. So the traditional calendar was actually a lunisolar calendar. It actually had always been a lunisolar calendar. And then some were saying, oh, the solar calendar is so clearly better. It must be the right one. Someone made a mistake somewhere along the line. Okay. So it, it would have, it, it's, it was um, innovators who probably themselves thought they weren't innovators. Like, I don't think they were faking that they thought that this is the original calendar. I think they thought this has to be the original calendar because it's, it's better. It doesn't have these ridiculous leap months, you know, it doesn't have, you know, like it, 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 it they thought a 364 day year was perfect. They didn't know that there were, they would need a leap year, right? They were like, it's 364 days. It is perfect. It works perfectly. This must be the original calendar. Someone messed up, right? But this was, in fact, an innovation in, 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 this, in this. So when, at what point did this innovation become popular? Um, you know, you, you wouldn't have it. Um, of course, you wouldn't have it before Alexander. Um, but then the question is, who, you know, who, who was nervy enough to say, hey, what we've been doing, all wrong. Anyway, so on that happy note, um, uh, please join me next week as we continue looking at Jubilees and seeing how this story gets developed into a much wider and very interesting kind of theology of how sin works and why very certain puzzling um, parts of the story and uh, and continue and then we'll we'll continue tracing this belief in different in different texts of the period. So I'll see you next week, everyone.